بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. Guys, whoever's gonna start, uh, is gonna join us, please come move forward. Make space for people to come back. Okay. So today's topic is on anger and resentment in relationships. And the reason I chose this topic is because it's it comes up a lot in my work with clients. And I think it's something that I, I feel like we need to talk about more in the Muslim community because we often mask um, difficult emotions like this because we think it means that we don't have faith or we're not like we don't have high iman if we feel anger if we feel resentment especially with anger and resentment I think there's like there's a lot more shame around those feelings because they're like oh those are bad feelings right <laughs> especially anger we know um, that's something that the Rasul would advise us you know against right to control our anger and but it doesn't necessarily mean that having anger and resentment is a negative reflection of your faith and that's something to really understand that your emotional experiences are so diverse and they're varying each day you can have a variety of emotions and Rumi he highlights this beautifully when he, he talks about um, when in his poem the guest house how, how many of you have uh, read that poem I really recommend you guys check it out it's really beautiful and helps shape how we how we should approach emotions so he says and I'm just gonna paraphrase the meaning but in his poem he talks about how every day is a guest house and that in each day there are these visitors that come in and sometimes it's a sadness sometimes it's a joy sometimes it's different kinds of emotions agitation right and he says welcome them all because they all have a message from the beyond and so the first thing I want to start off with is that resisting or denying your emotional experiences does not help you okay if anger comes up and you think oh no that makes me a bad muslim let me just like bury this that doesn't help you and it's gonna come out anyway and that's really important just because you suppress something or you deny its existence within you or you try to mask it with you know spirituality and this is something we call spiritual bypassing where people, and this happens very often in religious communities, and I see it very often in Muslim communities, where because of that stigma on mental health and because of that very rigid understanding of what faith looks like, that if they, anyone feels a negative experience or if they go through difficult things and they're having a negative emotional reactions to it, they try to package it nicely with Islam. So this deen is not meant to be a mask for our wounds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not prescribe Islam to be a mask for our wounds. It is a means for us to prioritize truth and and for us it's a means to healing, not a mask for our for our difficulties. So being Muslim and having different emotional experiences, even the the difficult ones, the ones that you identify as negative, are not mutually exclusive. <laughs> They can, you can, you can have Iman and have different emotional experiences and they both can sit right next to each other. The key is just how do we approach them? How do we react to them? Because actually when you suppress and when you deny something, what you didn't want to happen actually ends up happening. Where it comes out in a very, you know, out of proportion reaction. You know, but initially that's what you didn't want to happen. You want, you didn't want to have a reaction. So you were like, okay, let's just like, you know, put him, I'm not angry. I'm not upset. I'm not mad. No, alhamdulillah. <laughs> you know, like all the, all the things that we tell ourselves, I'm not saying not to say alhamdulillah, but I'm saying, be, let's be honest with yourself. Because what happens is, and by the way, one of the most common uh, things that anger and resentment in relationships are rooted in, and this is by the way, when I say relationships, I mean, not just marriages, friendships, you know, with your families right sibling relationships family relationships you know even with your co-workers right one of the most common you know root causes of anger and resentment building up is one denying their own needs and their own experience so over and over again you feel upset you don't say anything you get upset and you minimize your feeling you get annoyed 
oh, it's nothing. You gaslight yourself, <laughs> right? We often talk about gas, like the, the word gaslighting, we talk about it a lot in terms of other people, right? But many people gaslight themselves too. And so you you make yourself feel that what you're experiencing is not is not really there. Oh, it's all in my head. It's a gaslighting statement. <laughs> and so what happens is eventually that it comes out. <laughs> this is what leads to passive aggressiveness, where you actually say, you know, where you're actually angry, but you say it in a different way. So you don't appear angry, which tells you what, which tells you that the preoccupation is how you, your image. How do I, how am I looking? I don't want to be perceived as someone who's upset. So there's the reason why people get passive aggressive is because they have a negative, they have a negative association or negative image of being upset. And this is for different reasons. For many people, let's say they grew up in a home where, you know, it, conflict wasn't resolved in a healthy way or there was a lot of conflict and they associate now you know conflict equals bad very rigid very rigid association was made so they think that every time they're upset or every time they're angry that means oh I'm a bad person or I'm not good or I'm not um, it's me it's my fault or they grew up with a narcissist you know someone who always gaslit them and made them feel like their feelings didn't matter so i'm giving you these different examples so you can like assess within yourself well you know how do i deal with difficult emotions that come up for me and how well am i how comfortable do i feel communicating my my feelings because being upset does not have to lead into a lashing out reaction <laughs> you could just say you know hey that hurt me right you know, that hurt my feelings, or I don't feel comfortable, or this is not something that aligns with my values. You know, speaking up when something doesn't resonate with you is really important because in that moment, you don't abandon yourself. And so, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that, it, you know, this isn't like a blanket statement where like every time you're upset, you have to speak up. You can assess, right? Of course, we have to always also choose our battles. And we have to, everything is within balance and we have to assess, is this important to me to speak up? But you have to kind of check in with yourself first to assess that. How would you know what you value, what is important to you if you're constantly just going up with the motions and not really thinking about what is it that's important to you? Yeah. And so there are many reasons that that lead to anger and resentment in relationship and I'll, uh, relation, uh, re anger and resentment in relationships and I'll go over a few. In the Muslim community oftentimes um, what I've seen is a lot of codependency. You know unhealthy attachments and where codependency is primarily centered around a person not really knowing where they end and the other person begins not really seeing themselves as a separate self. So if somebody is upset with them or if somebody is having a, an, um, you know, a different experience or a negative experience, they associate with their own worth. So that makes it very hard to, to speak up for yourself. That makes it very hard to say your needs. That makes it very hard to, um, to set boundaries because you're always afraid that that other person is going to be, get upset with you or that other person might abandon you. So codependency is a whole different topic, but that's one of the most, uh, one of the common, um, you know, reasons I see this a lot, but there are many other reasons. Number one, expectations. Expecting, for example, putting all of your happiness and the responsibility of happiness, let's say, in the, in the responsibility of somebody else, in the hands of somebody else. And this happens a lot, especially like in marriages, you know, where people will get married and they have this idea that the other person is responsible fully for their happiness. This is a false um, expectation. It's already the groundwork for resentment because nobody's going to be, have, no human being has the capacity to fulfill that responsibility. No husband, no friend, no wife, right? Nobody. So, um, that can breed resentment. You have this expectation that they're going to prioritize, they're going to be responsible for your happiness. When they fall short, it makes you angry. It makes you resentful. 
and then also if you have that or if you have that um that expectation of yourself too it creates more resentment because if you are if you view, view yourself as responsible for somebody else's happiness then you're going to expect the same so if you're like bending over backwards and like breaking yourself to make somebody else whole and then that person is doing what they can but not the way you are doing it that's going to make you angry oh well i would do that for you why aren't you doing that for me so expectations agreeing to things that don't align with your values this is huge this is one of the most common things that can lead someone to feeling angry and resentful later is that in the moment you agree to do something that didn't align with with you didn't feel right to you and then the outcome of that was not also what was not what you what you wanted but even if the outcome was what you wanted you, you that impact is still there <laughs> whenever we go against our own values we feel we we feel the effect of that whether you're connected to it or not it doesn't feel good that's not inner alignment that doesn't feel that doesn't create peace within our being and so but whenever we do we we are aligned it's an opportunity to experience that peace and so assess yourself you know when someone asks you to do something and let's say it doesn't go with your religious beliefs doesn't go with your values you know what is more of a priority in that moment pleasing that person and making them happy or your beliefs and we know there's a saying in our faith subhanallah that you know if you seek to please allah and in doing so you displease the people allah will be pleased and then he makes the people pleased but if you seek to please the people and in doing so you displease allah allah becomes displeased and the people become displeased and I've seen this happen so many times. I've seen, you know, I've heard, I remember one person telling me that, um, you know, this is a, a, a teenager and he said, you know, I knew it was wrong to, to go to this specific setting and do this specific action, right? And when he was there, it was his non-Muslim friends that were like, why are you doing that? Aren't you Muslim? <laughs> you know, and he knew, he knew that like it wasn't right with him, but they didn't respect him for abandoning his own beliefs. This is, this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala though, you know, like when the eye of our heart is on Allah, He, con he controls the hearts of the people. And so, but this doesn't just have to be with, with beliefs, it could be with anything that you feel is just not in line with your values and not in line with what you feel is right in the moment. It's okay to say, you know what, I need time to think about this. It's okay to not know. You know what, I can't make a decision right now. Have you ever had those moments where you like were impulsive in a decision and then you're sitting there after you made a decision like, why did I do that? Did, you know, and you just like, and you feel even more anxious because now you committed to something that you didn't know if was in line with you. It's okay to pause and say, you know what? I need time to make this decision. I need to reflect on this. I need to pray on this. When you, when you slow down in life and your priority is your heart and it's connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you start building this muscle of being present in the moment with what's going on. And that anxiousness you used to feel to constantly make a decision, to constantly jump to the next moment, to constantly just wanting to please someone, over thinking about what is right in that moment, it starts to reduce. It starts to not be as powerful in your life. And so it's really important to, it's a muscle though. I always say that, right? Because it is a muscle and it's something you have to cultivate. It's not something that comes and happens just because we pray. It's something we have to actively, you know, build just like you would build regular physical muscles, right? And sometimes you get a little sore because you're working out a muscle that you haven't worked out before and so it doesn't feel too good 
it's so interesting right like that when people oftentimes when they start doing like inner work or they start practicing things like presence or intentions or even just like boundaries and, and things like you know that help improve them spiritually mentally emotionally praying on time whatever it is right sometimes they'll say i don't feel too good <laughs> is that a sign i should stop is that a sign it's not working so i always use that example well when you work out when you work out and you muscle you never feel good after right am i wrong does anyone ever like start a new workout and then feel completely like like they went to a massage no right you feel sore because that muscle and actually people who work out will like when they feel when they when they feel sore they'll actually be like oh it means like it's working right so you know that the pain or not the pain but that agitation right it tells you that the muscles doing something new and it's growing and it's building it's the same thing when we start working on ourselves and we start doing things that are uncomfortable when you feel agitated guess what that's a sign that your nafs is uncomfortable <laughs> and that's okay because your nafs is driven your nafs your you know this part of you that seeks instant gratification that your ego containing self this part of you that wants comfort it's not going to like when you do anything that doesn't make it feel good right away. Which is contrary to what the messages we're constantly getting in the world today, right? Because it's like, do what feels good. And if it doesn't feel good, cut it off. People, your work, anything, right? It doesn't feel good, just leave it. It's actually robbing people of the opportunity to build necessary muscles, spiritual and psychological muscles they need. And so it's not making us stronger, this mindset. It's not making us stronger mentally. It's not making us stronger emotionally. Even with this whole like oversimplification of like, you know, if a fam if someone agitates you or triggers you, cut them off, distance yourself from them. How many of you have heard stuff like this, right? It's, be it's becoming like a very common thing. But this actually, you know, can harm a person because I'm not talking about I mean, I understand if someone's physically abusive or outright Im verbally abusive, right? Then you're like, okay, this person just like, you know, insulted me. Like, I'm going to keep my distance, right? That's, that's normal reaction. But I'm talking about, oh, this person triggered me. I need, to, I need to keep a distance. Without that personal responsibility, that introspection of turning inward and assessing, well, what was it that triggered me? And how much of it is that person's responsibility? And how much does this experience call me to call upon me to do certain work? Because if you cut off everybody, every everything that triggers you, you're never what you're going to be by yourself. <laughs> you know, you're going to be like isolated. You can't guarantee. You can't place that in this world we live in. I'm telling you, it's more and more and more people are placing their peace in the hands of other people in the hands of that which is outside of them there's so much more entitlement i deserve this i deserve this i deserve this i i believe that we have we are worthy right there's a difference of worth but walking with this earth feeling like you deserve all these things does not equip you with the, with, the op with the necessary tools you're gonna need to actually grow. It's not gonna create opportunities for you to check your personal responsibility to do what you can and to overcome certain obstacles in your life. And so this leads to a lot of expectations. Well, I expect this person to I expect everybody to not trigger me and I expect everyone to, you know, to do this and to do that. It's, it's a lot. And then guess what? If you have those many expectations, then guess what's going to come after that? What is it? Anger, disappointment, resentment. So, so that's, that's, that's an important thing to consider. We have to look at how society and the world we live in influences our mindset and how we approach certain things in our world how we approach our interactions. Be careful of mindlessly absorbing things that you're learning. 
especially on social media. Just because you read a snippet that says, hey, if someone bothers you, cut off your family. Like, you know, like, take things with a grain of salt. And you really want to grow? You're not, it's not about, it's, you don't grow on social media. <laughs> Transformation doesn't happen on social media. You might have, you might gain one piece of knowledge, but it's what you do outside of that that leads to transformation, that leads to growth. So I'm not saying that there's nothing beneficial, but it's that's not where you're going to cultivate new habits. That's not where you're going to cultivate new changes in your life. Also, having expectations from people around you that you never communicated, which goes back to fear of communicating your needs. So when you're in a relationship, when you're in a friendship, when you are with loved ones, you should be able to disclose your expectation, right? Or disclose what your needs. And so, but if that's not something you learned, or if that's not the family system you grew up in, or if that's not what was cultivated, it can be very hard. A person can learn, you know, there's no space for me to communicate my needs. But then they go out into the world and then they, they do that with others their new friendships, the new people they meet in their life, right? They're in their marriages where they think, well, that person should just figure it out. Or that person should be able to understand that I was upset or that I was, you know, but that's not the way it goes. And so if you find yourself upset or resentful, ask yourself, did I ever communicate, you know, that feeling or that need to that person? And then if you can't, figure out why. Why is it that you can't? Because the thing is, is that, again, back to expectation, is that we have to also understand that not everyone we're going to be able to express our feelings to. You might express your feelings to one person and they don't know how to hold the space. There are some people who don't have the capacity to hold the space for other people's feelings. And I know this is a difficult truth. It's one of the hardest things, even in my work, when working with people, it's one of the hardest things to accept. But I want my parent to understand how much they hurt me, or I want my, my friend to understand, you know? And sometimes there are people, even your own, own, own family member, who might not have the capacity to hold the space for your pain. And it's sad, and it's hurtful, and Allah knows this. That's the key part. But if we go, but it, and, and it's hard to accept, but again, it goes back to, well, I need to change this belief that I expect everybody to be able to hold the space for me. Because that's not reality, right? So are we communicating our needs and expectations? Fearing confrontation, this is a big one. Avoid conflict. You avoid being con you avoid that confrontational feeling. There's a lot of people who really fear confrontation. They get a lot of anxiety, you know, even just the thought of like their supervisor asking them to come to their office because they have to talk to them. They get a lot of anxiety or or a friend says, "Hey, I need to talk to you." Uh, or a friend telling them this hurt, they get very anxious and it's very it's a muscle though. It's really a muscle and it, you can get better. But you you fear what you don't know. <laughs> And once you try it and you see, okay, well, you know, I came out okay. You know, and you actually see the benefits of it. You know, a lot of people, after they, they face that fear and, you know, yeah, sometimes it might not go well. And sometimes that person doesn't have a, the capacity. But if you stop trying, you'll never get a chance to meet that person who actually holds a space for what you have to share. And so it's a lot of times when people have experiences that are toxic or have experiences with people who are you know, let's say they came from, you know, a dysfunctional family system or they've had dysfunctional relationships in the past where there was no space for their emotions. They have this belief that it's going to be like this for the rest of their life. But through vulnerability, through doing this work, you actually come across the truth that no, not everyone is like this. And there will be people that can that can communicate and want to communicate just like you do. You know. But it's hard. It's hard to, to, to go through that and not have that space of, of having your emotions met. Uh, denying or devaluing your needs. That's another one, right? That's what we talked about. You know, not knowing. First of all, that, that's, there's two parts to this. First, you knowing what your emotional needs are. 
and then you communicating them. And a lot of people don't communicate them because they don't know what they are to begin with. So knowing your emotional needs is crucial. What do I need in a relationship to thrive? What do I need in this friendship? What do I need in this situation? Let's say there's a conflict or there's a, a difficulty with someone in your life. What is it that I need in this moment that can help me get past this or that can help me overcome this? Trying to control people in your life. Control is such a, like, um, I know it has like a huge negative connotation, but control is not always, you know, the extreme kind that we, we think of, right? Like a narcissistic control. Control is just you trying to monitor other people's impression of you and not allowing yourself to be yourself. Not letting yourself be true. Um, and, you know, trying to, to, to take a hold of something that is not in your power. That's what control is. You trying so hard to have an impact on something that really isn't in your power. A lot of things you can't impact. You can't impact people's reactions. You can't impact people's reactions to you. You can't control that. You can't control that because you're kind to someone that they're going to be kind back. The, there's so many things that we have to change our beliefs about because m many people have this belief that if I do good, that person's going to do good to me. If I'm kind to that person, then everybody, if I'm kind to everyone, everyone's going to be kind. But this is a false belief and people get really shaken up by this. But then we have to ask ourselves, what made me have that belief in the first place? And actually letting go, having that moment where you ask yourself, where did I, like, okay, maybe I need to let go of this belief, actually leads to a lot of freedom afterwards. Because now you go into the world and you, you, you do good for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without that expectation that if I do, if I'm, you know, if I'm kind, everyone's kind. That's not, you know, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the kindest person. And his own family, he had own, his own, people from his own family do the worst to him. We have these examples for a reason. But at the end of the day, this work matters because your heart becomes a little freer. You're not constantly at the mercy of other people's reactions. What is that person gonna say? What is that person gonna do? You know, constantly trying to control the situation, controlling the outcome. You know, you can't make people stay in your life. You can't make people love you the way you love them. You can't make people react the way you would react. You can't make people give the way you would give. You can't make people communicate the way you would communicate. But the only thing you can control is the way you give, the way you show up, your kindness, what you say, and that's what helps you sleep at night. Is your connection to that. But if you do all of these things, if you're kind and you're giving and you're prioritizing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seeing you and you're doing all this good, but at the end of the day, you're still connected to what you received from the people, you're not going to sleep well at night. So, so what's the key here? It's not that you did, it's what help, what is the key here? Like in what helps you sleep at night? It's what you're connected to because there are many people who do good and they like, for example, in a situation, right? They did good by the person, they did right by the person, but they're ruminating over this time and time again. You know, why? Because the other person's reaction was not kind. The other person's reaction was dismissive or the other person treated them wrongly, wrongfully. And I, I know it's natural to think about things, you know, like, okay, what happened in this situation? What was my role? But I'm talking about letting it really take control over you where you're forgetting that in front of Allah, you're okay. <laughs> So it's, a so it's a lack of connection to what you actually did and greater connection to what the people did and then judging yourself by what the people did. So then sitting there and thinking, oh, well, you know, it's my fault or I did something wrong or, you know, I'm not, I'm not good enough. Just judging it by other people's reaction, forgetting that, okay, is what I said true? Is what I said kind? 
Was it respectful? Did I think about it? Did I, did I do anything haram? Did I do anything wrong? You know, those are the things you have to root yourself in. Everything else you can't control. It's easier said than done, but it's what helps you take your power back. So it's important. Asking for things in a way that's not productive or not assertive, you know, passive, like for example, or nagging, you know, blaming, um, accusing. So sometimes when people have a lot of anger and resentment and they're not communicating their needs, it comes off in that nagging way, it comes off in that blaming way. It comes off like they're attacking the other person and it's oftentimes the other person doesn't know. Where's this coming from? All they see is that person attacking them, blaming them. And you see this when you're you know, working with couples a lot, like one, one spouse is saying the other person is nagging them and the other person has all these unmet needs that they never communicated and it comes out in that nagging way. So going back to learning, you know, to identifying what is it that you need and how am I communicating them? Denying reality, um, that this is another one where like things will happen over and over again and it shows you the truth and you deny it because you don't want to risk conflict, you don't want to risk uh, difficult discussions. This happens a lot. A person will hurt you or they'll do something that is not in line with your values or not something that is kind to you and you, you're like ignoring it because the pain of that friendship being broken or the pain of that relationship being broken or the pain of them getting mad at you or displeased with you is more is more is harder for you to face but there's greater there's great consequences to that because when you reality teaches you a lot about and what a person does and how they are with you teaches you a lot if you want to see where you stand in people's life it's not about what they say it's how it's their actions so people do show you the truth through their actions but if you're constantly, you know, and it's okay to give people, of course, you, giving people the benefit of the doubt was important. But again, spiritual bypassing is, is, is constantly ignoring like very obvious hurtful things and saying, no, I have to give them the benefit of the doubt. That's not, you know what I mean? That's not giving the benefit of the doubt. But it's really recognizing that, you know, well, this isn't okay. And it's okay for me to acknowledge that it's not okay. And I have to take care of myself. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want us to expose ourselves to things that are harmful. If, if he doesn't want someone else to receive our abuse or our, you know, or putting someone else down, why would he want us to receive it from somebody else? We are his creation too. Wanting, expecting people to meet your needs when they have proven time and time again they are incapable of meeting your needs that's a huge one so you you have a friend you you have you're struggling with something you go talk to them very invalidating minimize your struggle tell you you're too sensitive okay you try again they do the same thing but you keep going back to them even though this person has proven that they are they do not have the capacity to hold the space for you this is going to make you more angry more resentful so in that moment, you have to say, okay, well, this person has shown me enough for me to come to the conclusion that they're incapable of, you know, they're incapable of holding a space for me. And that's okay. By the way, when we set boundaries, and this is something that I think Islam teaches us really beautifully, is that when we set boundaries or when you decide, for example, that a certain person is not helpful, is not, you know, good for you in your life, you don't always have to walk away with a heart that hates them or dislikes them. You can recognize that a person has limitations and still walk away saying that person has limitations. They're just not, it's not good for me. And it doesn't match what I need. This is how we take care of our heart. But of course, if that person hurt you, you know, I'm not saying, you know, that you're not allowed to feel pain or anything like that, but I'm saying that sometimes when people People associate boundaries with walking away angry or walking away. No, we can just recognize that this is not a good fit. And 
The thing is, is that the titles we give people in our lives matter. And the titles we give people in our lives come with minimal expectations. So for example, if you call someone a spouse, that comes with minimal expectations. This concept of don't expect anything from, you know, it's not, it's not human. You don't call someone a spouse unless there's minimal expectations that come with that role, correct? You support each other, that you're there for each other. Same thing with friendships. You, you don't call someone a friend and say there's no expectations. Then no, you could just call her, you could call that person acquaintance. You don't need to call that person a friend. So sometimes you just need to adjust how you view a person in your life. Maybe, maybe that person is a great acquaintance, but not a, not a friend. That person is my sister in faith, but maybe not a close friend. You know, she has rights over me. You know, if she needs me, I'll be there. But you know what? I don't need to be sharing my personal, my personal struggles with her. So it's the same thing with just any relationship is that you have to assess, you know, why you call that person that you give them that place in your life. And what are the minimal expectations that come with it? And if you are in a relationship, in a friendship, in a marriage, what, you know, and someone says you shouldn't expect anything, even the bare minimum, that's not okay. Because <laughs> it's not realistic. And so, many times, it, it really just takes a little bit of reflection on what is the nature of that relationship? What am I getting out of it? What is the role that I play? You know, and, and how to change the way we view it. Trusting um, and relying on people that have proven to not be trustworthy. Same thing. Someone lies to you and then you gaslight yourself, right? You convince yourself and then you go back. You tell them another thing. Or they, they're dishonest again. And those moments you're really ignoring your gut. Your intuition that's telling you something is off here. This isn't right. And I want to share um, this beautiful quote by Ibn Qayyim, rahimullah. He says, a friend, will not sh a friend will not literally share your struggles. And a loved one cannot physically take away your pain. And a close one will not stay up the night on your behalf. So look after yourself, protect yourself, nurture yourself, and don't give life's events more than what they are really worth. Know for certain that when you break, no one will heal you except you. And when you are defeated, no one will give you victory except your determination. Your ability to stand up again and carry on is your responsibility. Do not look for your self-worth in the eyes of the people. Look for your worth from within your conscience. If your conscience is at peace, then you will ascend high. And if you truly know yourself, then what is said about you won't harm you. It's really beautiful. I encourage you to look it up on your own time and by Ibn Qayyim, rahimullah, and um, and you know sit with it because it's really powerful. This is like a, one of my favorite timeless. Um, you know sayings because it really does help you take your power back and remember what role can I play in my own situation what do I have to release so I'm not as angry what expectation do I have to adjust so this doesn't happen again what do I need to do so that I can build the muscle of being more freer and being you know um, not as or, or build the muscle of setting boundaries and communicating my needs so that I, I am true to myself and I'm true to my values. And I'll stop here and take questions, inshallah. Yeah. Um, um, when you talk about, uh, you know, not going to people repeatedly who don't hold that space for you, um, it's, it's easier with uh, acquaintances or friends that we can, you know, change. But what about relationships that we can't really, you know, get rid of? Like uh, parents or uh, uh, husbands or uh, spouse or uh, people like that. So, because we have to hold the bare minimum. 
and yeah. you know you keep going back to those relationships uh, always mm -hmm. and if you don't go back if, you know people make us feel uh, the other person would make us feel bad that you know why are you avoiding why are you not doing your duty mm -hmm. towards us why are you not maintaining that connection with us yeah but to protect yourself you have to you know somehow uh, break that connection yeah it's difficult when it comes to family i mentioned earlier i don't know if you were here for this but i was mentioning that like you know with parents or with family sometimes part of the healing journey you know is not so much that the parent comes to realize oh you know yes acknowledge your feelings or validate or a spouse sometimes or a spouse comes to realize sometimes it's expect it's it's adjusting that it's actually coming to terms that right now this person is not going to do that for me and it's so hard i was saying earlier it's really hard to acknowledge that but it's also freeing because what happens is when you when you keep trying, keep trying, that person is not capable, you're hurting yourself in that pursuit. You're hurting yourself constantly in that pursuit to keep trying to get that person's approval, to keep trying to get that person's validation. It breaks you more and more, you know? So there comes a point, even when I work with people where if they've tried and tried, there comes a point where it's about now getting them to, helping them, you know, accept that they might not get that from that person right now. And that they have a choice here now. It's not just, oh, that person, you know, can't give that to me. No, they have a choice now. How are they gonna how are they gonna respond to this? You know, how what boundaries are they gonna set? You know, and so boundaries are really essential. It's for example, if there's somebody that you always feel like you have to tell everything to, and let's say uh, you know, that always results in conflict, then you say, you know what, maybe I need to just not maybe I, I don't need to I need to assess what I'm going to share you know that's a boundary not sharing everything is a boundary you know not uh, exposing yourself constantly in that environment is a boundary it's not necessarily about cutting off but maybe minimizing it yeah. maybe um, putting something in place instead so you know you have something else that you're doing instead of having to be in that environment there's different ways and I, I always hesitate to give feedback when it comes to general you know because it's it's hard everybody's situation is different so I would have different feedback for different situations but I it is very difficult it's very difficult when you're dealing with family when people are dealing with their parents I work with people who have suffered great trauma at the hands of their parents I can't even get their parents to say that it happened can get can't even get their parents to say that you know they're sorry that it happened <laughs> you know so it's very hard it's very hard yeah. any other questions yeah i was trying to think of how to like tie this into you know like the early oma and like mm -hmm. would you say it's fair to say that like the sahaba were trying to meet spiritual needs outside of their culture right they kind of like created mm -hmm. their own family in a way like I'm thinking yes. about it like a lot of them were rejected by their family absolutely yeah. and like if they had continued to try to seek their family's validation for their dean like they mm -hmm. would just have not progress so do, do you think that that's like a fair way absolutely to, uh, to I always it? absolutely I always say that we have communal uh, um, responsibilities as well as individual responsibilities right like we as a community there had there this dean has is is individual and collective right it has collective measures and individual measures and as he points pointed out you know that at the time of the prophets of the lord of them they benefited so from so many therapeutic um let's say qualities or characteristics from that community that things that they didn't might not have gotten from their own families let's say someone converted they were rejected by their own by their own tribe right but they found though that that belonging that support and that's and that is something that i think is is lacking because even though we have more spaces in our time and more you know communal you know um things happening i think that still connection is is decreasing so i'll hear this all the time where people will say i go into a gathering yeah i went to this event i went to this event but they leave not feeling connected not feeling a sense of connection with the people who they went they they were there around and that's something we need to fix in our community because community spaces are not supposed to be the spaces that people isolate from when they are struggling it's supposed to be the space that people come to when they are struggling 
but unfortunately when people struggle nowadays one of the first things they do is they isolate from the community because they feel like they can only go back into the community when they're perfect when things are going well and it's because of how we treat difficulties and circumstances we we ask about people's milestones their achievements their houses their cars their 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 jobs right but we don't ask about people's hearts we don't say how's your heart you know and it might seem like something like weird to ask but it's so important to ask somebody how is your heart because it'll maybe throw them off you know in the first because it's like oh but it's because they actually have to check in to answer that question because if you just say how are you doing they're going to be like good how are you that's just it but if you say how is your heart oh man <laughs> right like i have to think about that so see people. This is one of the, 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 the things that we're missing in our community when people, you know, and I'm really happy you mentioned this because there are people, when people don't ha have struggles at home and when they have parents they can't talk to and when they have siblings they can't go to and they have spouses they can't go to, they come to the community, they want at least one person that can see them, that can make them feel seen as they're going through the struggle. And so... Yeah, we live in a time where, I, I always say is we live in a time with no Medinas, <coughs> you know? And we live in a time where we don't have the therapeutic qualities of Medina. We have, don't get me wrong, we have some, right? But we don't have the same, like, level of therapeutic qualities, like, at the time of Medina. And we need to create that, and the way we can create that is by working on ourselves individually. Do you see your own heart? Do you value checking in with your own heart? Because if you don't value checking in with your own heart, oh, you'll never ask someone how their how's their heart, <laughs> you know? Because you you cringe at even that thought or that 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 moment of checking in. Yeah. No. No. Yes. So let me try to tie in a couple of concepts. I'm sorry if it's a bit confusing. No, it's okay. And it sort of goes off the first question too. So like, our parents are sometimes the people who cannot hold space for us, right? Mm -hmm. um, but we can walk away from that relationship um we so can how do you know you're talking about picking your battles so like mm -hmm. how do you know did you say we can or we can't we can't oh we can't okay <laughs> so how do you know how to pick your battles mm -hmm. like when your parents may want you to act in a way that doesn't align with your values and that causes this mm -hmm. so how do you pick your battles mm -hmm. like sometimes you just like acquiesce and take that resentment or like how do you know how to pick your battles in that sort of situation yeah that's a good question so he's asking how do we know when to pick our battles with parents right i would say first and foremost you you don't acquiesce or you don't adjust or adapt or i mean like accommodate sorry that's a better word um when it goes against your beliefs that's first and foremost right i mean the father of ibrahim wanted him to be an idolater right did he accommodate it was, did he say, okay, I have to obey my parent? No. So when it comes to your beliefs, absolutely not, right? When it comes to things that bother you and things that you feel cause anger and resentment, you have to assess what it, what comes up most in your reactions, right? What is the thing that impacts you most when it comes to your interactions with your parents? So if there's something that you feel consistently triggers you, consistently shows up in your reaction to them, that makes it even worse and makes it even harder to be kind, right? Then you have to assess that. You have to re that's something that you can't continue to accommodate anymore because it's leading to f greater problems, you know, in your reactions. And this is what happens. People think, oh, I have to, I'm, 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 um, I'm being obedient to my parent right now. But then by suppressing it, it actually leads to disrespect later on, on a much greater level than if you had just communicated and said, you know, I, this doesn't feel comfortable to me. I don't feel, you know, I, I don't, I don't want mean to disrespect you. You know, I love you, but I can't do this right now. And just to communicate your feelings, um, it's easier said than done. I understand the cultural um, expectations. I understand that it, it's it's something that is not easy. But I think that you have to at least try to have that conversation, knowing your parents, and and you have to assess how to best approach that, right? Everybody's parents are different. Some link, some some approaches won't work with you know one parent, and what what will work with another. So, but if 
but you can't keep suppressing something if it's showing up in your behaviors and your anger and your resentment very frequently. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a great answer. And if something you feel like is you're able to, you know what, this doesn't really affect me. This doesn't affect my behaviors. This doesn't affect, you know, maybe I, like I can let this list go, you know, I, I can. And you make the intention that even though it's uncomfortable, you, you're doing it for the sake of Allah, you know. And so we have that in our deen too, like that, yeah, there are going to be times where something is uncomfortable for us, but it's not harmful. That's the difference. It's not harmful, but it's uncomfortable. Okay, but it's okay. My, I can, I can. I can take this discomfort for the sake of Allah to please my, my parent. That's huge in front of Allah. Right? But not accepting harm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not ask of you to accept harm for the sake of pleasing anyone. Yeah. You talked about how you cannot make other people communicate the way you communicate or show love the way you mm -hmm. show them love. Or and you talked about how if you're doing things mindlessly or you're, you're in the same situation, you cannot transform. You have to get out of that environment to transform. So I, I'll give you two examples. And um, if, if, you, if you have a younger brother who, who plays video games constantly, like mm -hmm. unhealthy hours, or a husband or someone who's on bed for hours on end, and then you're communicating, you're trying, you're trying to help them to transform, to move out of their whatever environment, but they're not listening to you. We, you have tried everything, like uh, communicating with compassion, communicating with uh, you know tough words or tough love. You know, and then you, how how does one when other, another person does not reciprocate? What do you do? Do you give up for the sake of your own sanity? And even if you give up, I don't think so. You can you can uh, separate yourself from like looking at them or going through them because I, you in some way live with them in the same environment. So how does one make peace? Yeah. Whatever the situation. There's a way, I think, to shift your connection, right? In those moments where you're still in the same environment, but where your heart is looking becomes different. I think what leads us to feeling exhausted is we keep our heart fixated on the same place and expecting the same result. And so in those moments, you have to bring it back to Allah. You have to say, I'm fixating on... I, I do this, they have to do this. I do this, then they should do this, right? And it's not working. It's not working. So my speech is not working. My actions are not working. I'm, my, my, my attempts to try to get them to listen are not working. I got to shift the heart. I got to fixate on who is in control. And it's by, give you know, just, you got to, just changing where you're, you're looking, you know? Okay, I'm so fixating on them to change, but you know what? I'm going to fixate on Allah right now. And you're still in the same environment. But you know what? The, 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 the emphasis you're giving to that is no longer the same. And that's the thing. We, we don't always have to change our environment for us to feel peace. I mean, Yaqub was around his, his children who attempted to, to kill his own child. <laughs> right? And so, I mean, think about this. But what did he do? He ashku bathi wa huzni Allah. Right? I complain of my my um, my struggle, my sorrow, my grief to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And so what is that? It's a turning of the lens. It's it's okay, I'm not i I'm not gonna fixate on them. I'm gonna fixate on Allah. I, I remember hearing the story one time from a friend who was telling me about, you know, another friend who was struggling with um, having it, she wanted to have children and her husband didn't want to have children. And so she kept, you know, talking to him about having children. He just was so adamant. You get so angry. I don't want to have children. Case closed. She tried for so many, so long she tried, right? And then she said, it's not working. Keep talking to him. It's not working. I keep trying. I keep trying. I keep trying. And then she said, you know what? I'm just going to, I'm not going to ask him anymore. I'm not going to talk about it anymore. I'm just going to do a istighfar. I'm going to just, every time I think about it, I'm going to engage in a istighfar. And one day... Without her even trying, he came to her and, and said that he's ready to have children. You know, a lot of times when people go to the scholars and say, I have this problem or I have this, you know, they say, do istighfar, do istighfar. Because istighfar has so many benefits. Number one, when you do istighfar, you, you shift your, the eye of your heart from the people and from this world to the akhirah because you're asking for forgiveness, right? So what are you asking? why would you ask for forgiveness if the priority of your heart is not on the akhirah? Right? So you, you end up shifting that focus. Okay, let me do istighfar. 
be what is istighfar right and when you do istighfar you it's like a removal of barriers that's the way i like to think of it because we know that you know the rasul equates a black um a sin to a black dot on the heart right and so you do you, you and we're always sinning right it could be things that are even unintentional and you do something then you another black dot another black dot what is that it becomes like a barrier around the heart barrier that keeps you from accessing this heart keeps you from connecting, keeps you from accessing your, the Iman, accessing from all the, all the beautiful abilities that this heart has. So when you do istighfar, it's like removal of this barrier. Every istighfar is like, you could even, you could even just imagine, like, you know, like imagine like your, the walls of your heart just, you know, falling off. Your heart becoming purer and closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so in doing so, you're, you're increasing your Iman, but you're also becoming lighter spiritually because you're letting go of things that don't serve you you know and you're removing walls between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so when you make when you remove something you make room for something right like if you wanted to decorate your home are you going to bring in the new furniture and the decoration before you actually clean it you're not you're going to clean up like I'm talking about big like you want to redecorate or I know I see your face you're like I'll put it in the closet and I'll clean mine <laughs> you know no I mean like if you you have like really nice stuff you're gonna if you okay you're gonna put a new rug let's just say let me be specific put a new rug right you're not gonna just put it on the floor you're gonna when you remove the old rug you'll be like let me mop let me mop this floor <laughs> right let me clean it you want to put you want to decorate in a in a nice clean place you want to but also you have to remove the old for you to put a new rug, you got to remove the old rug that's stained. You got to remove the, you know, you got to remove the stuff that you want to make room for. That's what istighfar is. You're making room for what you want Allah to give you. When I do Ramadan prep with my students, I always say istighfar is, and we should, now that Ramadan is coming close, you know, istighfar is a great way to prep our hearts because you make room for what you want Allah to give you in Ramadan. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Because um, there are people who have expectations of us too, mm -hmm. not only us having expectations of them, if that makes sense. Yeah. And, um, sometimes it can feel overwhelming, but I also want to like sometimes share my space with others, like, mm -hmm. like listen to them and uh, you know help them as much as I can. Yeah. So how can we? Um, I guess. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, so her question was, how do we basically hold space for others when we ourselves are struggling, right? I would say number one, communication. You have to be able, you have to communicate where you're at, especially to people you love and people who are invested in, in your, in you know, in your life, right? And who might not understand what's going on with you. To take the time to say, you know what, I'm really struggling right now and I'm going through my own healing or going through my own process or how much you feel comfortable. You don't even need to over explain, but just just to say like, you know, right now I, I really do am struggling with the capacity, you know, with, with being there for you as I want to be, you know. At the same time, I wouldn't dismiss completely the power of showing up for people even when you yourself don't have the capacity. I'll tell you something, There's, there, it's a balance like you said, right? But it's but but cutting yourself off completely from giving or doing good or showing up for people is not helpful to you even, you know. And I think that's that's something a lot of people are doing nowadays when they're going through struggles or when they're 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 you know uh, going through a difficult time. They tend to isolate completely, and that actually creates more problems in the long run. So it's okay to have alone time and it's good to disconnect, it's good to recharge, but when it becomes prolonged periods where it leads to isolation, it actually could have harmful effects. There is great power in doing something for others because it releases that burden on yourself, that focus focus on yourself. Too much folk, anything with that out of balance is not good. Too much self-focus is not healthy. It really isn't. And that's, this is why, even in the research, they say that people who go out and give charity or, you know, or go help somebody else when it actually can help them reduce symptoms of depression, it can help them feel, um, you know, more joy, more peace in, the, in those moments. Because you're, you're in giving, we are, create, we are creatures of connection. 
And so when we give, we feel the benefit of that. Also, I'll end with this. I, I know we have to wrap up. Don't underestimate the power of going to help someone even when you doubt your ability to help. There are many times even in my own life where, you know, if I'm going through something and someone asks me of something or wants my help, I'll, I'll maybe I'll say, you know, oh man, how, what do I have to, wh how can I help them when I'm myself, I'm struggling right now. I cannot begin to tell you how many times when, if I decide to go and help that person, even when I myself was struggling, Allah never lets you leave empty handed. Because when you go and you do good for his creation, he, ser he does something for you. And it's through serving his creation that he gives you what you need. You never walk away empty handed. I've never walked away empty handed, meaning like, you know, within my heart from a situation where I went to help somebody. And even if you go and you feel like, hey, you know what, right now, I I, this goes beyond my capacity, communicate that. But at least you showed up. And then if there are times where you feel like you can't, that's okay too. But don't stay in that space for too long. Okay. All right. I will wrap up here because I know um, we have class. All right. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa Thank you guys. I'll see you guys next week. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.